Paul says this. Therefore, my beloved brother, who I long to see, my joy and my crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm. Don't back down now, is what he's saying. And then he addresses something, where, and I'm just going to make note of it in verses 2 and 3. Understand this church was started from a women's Bible study, if you want to call it that. It was started, they were meeting by the river, and this church was started from a woman's Bible study. And then when you get to chapter 4, you see there's a little, there's some conflict going on. And he says this in 2. He says, I urge you, Doet, uh, Udia, and Syntex to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you to help these women who have shared in my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay. Real quick, real quick, because I don't want to dwell too long on this one today, because we've got too many other good things to do. But there was this issue, and he's saying, hey, don't choose sides. Build them up together. Quit choosing sides, and get back to the work of the Lord. That's what he's saying. He's saying, these, these, these women helped build this place, and if you're going to get anything done, essentially, you can't, you can't get back to it, or you're going to ruin it all. Right? That's what he's saying. All right, let's move on. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gracious or gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, good repute. If there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. You know, here's the deal. I've been in church all my life. All my life. Anybody else been in church all your life? Right? There are those people, because I've been in church all my life and I've heard lots of stuff, and I've heard people say, oh, church is so out of touch with reality. Anybody else heard that? Oh, they're so out of touch with reality. They, they, that's, that's fine. Religion's great for little kids and old women, but it's not really where we really live. It can't do anything for me. I've heard that. And that's not... True, it's not this pie, they call it pie in the sky belief. They say, oh, church, you can't connect with reality. Church, critics call it nice poetry, but they say it's unconnected to the human condition. But in his letter to Philippians here, Paul says, if we apply real truth to our human struggles, if we apply real truth to our human struggles, it will make a difference. Can anybody say, yeah, I can see that. If we apply real truth of the Word of God to our human struggles, it'll make a difference. And that's what Paul is saying in Philippians. He's saying here in chapter 4, this is what I'm telling you to do. If you want to make a difference in the stuff you're going through right now, this is what you need to do. And he starts naming some things. There's seven things here that we're going to look at. And he says, remember, remember, we are citizens of heaven. You are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of heaven. He didn't just fling us out here and say, I hope, hope, let us know how it turns out. He did not do that. He said, you are, I made you a citizen of heaven. You have rights and privileges here. You have the access to the Father here as a citizen of heaven. And so with that, there are seven things in those few little verses, and you're going to go, I'm not going to remember all seven of these, Steve. Austin, hit that next slide. Uh, next slide. There we go. If you remember one, that's a good thing. If you can remember them all, that's cool. If you don't, I'll text them to you. But there's seven things here he says that will make a difference. If we apply these seven things in the reality in which we live in right now, if it's a bad day, it's still going to bring us to the Father who says, if you come to me, I'm coming back to you. 
If you come to me, I'll share in that burden that you carry. So the first thing Paul says is to stand firm in the Lord. The second thing he says is rejoice. Express the joy that God has given us as believers. Do you have joy as a believer? I'm asking, no, I'm, let me ask anybody who's been in church over 40 years. Do you have joy as a believer? Is, is it the same joy you had 40 years ago? No, it's better. Ah, there you go. I like that. There you go. It better be better, right? 40 years of doing this, if all we have is, nah, it's not the same as it used to be. It's on us. It's not on God because he's as vibrant as he's ever been. Rejoice, he says. Don't worry. Don't be anxious about anything. Don't live in constant fear. Number four, he says, pray about everything we face in life. Number five, think about things. The, focus on good things, the positive things. Number six, practice what you preach. Choose to do right. And the seventh thing is experience the peace of God and the God of peace. Experience the peace of God and the God of peace. So I'm going to go through these. Hit me up if, afterwards if you say, yeah, I didn't get that. What was that one? I'll, I'll, I'll get it to you. But the first one is this, verse 1. He says, stand firm in the Lord. Beloved, my beloved brother, whom I long to see, my joy, my crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord. When you, and this is not the first time Paul has written about standing firm. He spent a, an entire chapter in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, stand firm. Multiple times he says, stand firm. When you stand firm, you say, I am not backing down from what I know is right. Are you with me? I'm not backing down. Now, sometimes, let me just be clear. The harder we stand firm... Sometimes the harder the wind blows. Sometimes, because I'm telling you, the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, there's a target on your back by the enemy of your soul who wants to take you out. And everybody else who says, I stand with Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian, he's going, I want them. I'm going to take them out. So if anybody tells you, oh, it's going to be easy, or after you're a Christian, I'm telling you the truth. That you've got headwinds that you're going to have to work through. But, but, with the rest of what we're going to see here, we go, that's worth it. Every bit of it's worth it. Stand firm. God is for you. He will be with you. How do you stand firm? How do you, how do you, you know, in, in addition to just saying, well, I'm going to stand firm, what does it mean? Well, it means that if God is for it, I'm for it. And if God is against it, I'm against it. Even if everybody else says, oh, you're so out of touch. Do you hear me? Even when everybody says, oh, you're so out of touch. If God's for it, I'm for it. If God's against it, I'm against it. That's standing firm in the word of the Lord. It is following God's word every day of our life. So that regardless of whether or not everybody else in the room is doing it, you're not. Because God says, I'm, don't do that. Remember, remember going through that as teenagers? If you were a Christian as, as, and a teenager as a Christian... You know, everybody was going to here and going to there, and it's like, I'm not going. Okay. Well, you're so out of touch. Is God against good time? Nope. But he's against that kind of good time. And understand, I come from the 70s. All the bad stuff that's happening right now, we invented it. <laughs> we invented all the bad stuff in the 70s. Amen. <laughs> oh, now revival starts. That's awesome. Sometimes, many times, or maybe most times, God's people do have to stand alone. Girls, sometimes God's people have to stand alone. You stand firm. You are committed to do what he says to do. You are committed to live the ways he says to live. We stand firm. Because he says, if you'll do that, the God of peace will be with you. You'll have the peace of God, and the God of peace will be with you. All right, that's number one. Number two, rejoice. Express the joy God has given us as believers. Verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You can't rejoice without joy in the first place. I'm taking you deep today, right? <laughs> you can't 
rejoice if you don't have joy in the first place. And understand, joy isn't something we can just work up like a froth in our own selves. Okay? There's happiness and there's joy. Those two are not the same. And joy is not something that we can make up on our own. How do you know that? Well, first of all, I know that in Nehemiah, the Old Testament, just one of the scriptures says, and a lot of the Psalms say the same thing. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says, don't be dejected and, and sad. Don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, now, if I can't make up my own joy, how do I get joy? Well, go to Galatians. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Ephesians, Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. So it's a couple, back, a couple books back. Galatians chapter 5. See, joy is an output of the fruit of the Spirit. You can't have the fruit of the Spirit if you don't have the Spirit. I'm talking the Holy Spirit. You don't get the Holy Spirit unless you've been saved by Jesus Christ. We get, when we are saved by Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit to live in our lives. And when he starts to live in our life, then we have something that starts to happen. We have, it's like, like watching, I, I like, really, there's things I like to watch grow. Corn's one of those things. Tomatoes, one of those things. Apples, for whatever reason, I like watching apples grow. And when apples grow, you see, first of all, the little blossoms coming out in the spring. It's like, oh, yeah, spring's coming. You know? And you see that grow. You see, man, that apple tree's loaded with blossoms. That's awesome. And then come August, September, you get to see what kind of fruit's really on there. And that's what happens to us when we are in Christ, we get the Holy Spirit. And when we get the Holy Spirit, he starts doing things in our life. And there's output. There's, there's, there's things that happen that we see, physically see, that are proof that we're being changed. So, Galatians chapter 5 <coughs> says this. Verse 16, and then we'll read 22 through 25. <coughs> I say walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We could stop right there and go home. I say walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Let's say it together. I say walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. How do you fix all that bad stuff? Walk in the spirit. All right, then he goes on, 22, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, there it is, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. None of those are against the law. Now, those who belong to Jesus Christ, listen to me, those who belong to Jesus Christ have Crucify the flesh with his passions and the desire. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. And so what is it? If we can't make up joy, where does it come from? It comes from the fruit of the Spirit. And if we don't have the Spirit living in us, we can't really have true joy. We can have happiness, but happiness comes and goes. When, this, when the new wears off the shiny car, all the happiness is gone. When, the, when that new car smell is gone. When that new car smell is gone, it's like, I'm not as happy with this car as I used to be. Right? When the new wears off, the happiness goes away. But joy comes because it's planted there by the Holy Spirit. And we can be joyful even when things aren't going our way. I, I only got one amen back there. Let me say that again. We can be joyful even when things aren't going our way. Amen. There we go. As a believer in Jesus Christ, he continues to do a work in us, every one of us. He continues to change us. He continues to take us to this place where we are to be more and more and more and more like him. If we'll let him. If we'll let him. One way you can tell if you are growing in Christ is by the outpouring of fruit of the Spirit in your life. Let me put it this way. It says, there, 
Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Let's just take those. Are you more loving than you were before? Saint of God, you've been in church for a long, long time. Are you less loving than you used to be? Hey, are you going backwards? Are you more loving? Is there joy in your life? If there's not, if there's not joy, you have to ask, what's going on with that apple tree? Don't you, don't you stop him. That's awesome. That's, I, don't you stop him from praising. Let him go. Let him go. If there's not joy in our life, there should be. If there's not, what happened? Because I've got it in black and white right here. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience. So, I mean, we got it documented. That's going to happen in our life. If there's not, now I'm not talking about happiness, because happiness comes and happiness goes. But if there's not joy in our life, there's not love in our life, there's not peace in our life, how come? Because God promised to give that to us. If we're a Christian and we're walking around going, I don't know, this, I don't know, this is, I'm mad all the time. Okay? Something's not right. That tree's not growing right. And if that tree's not growing right, and you've got a promise that says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, and you're going, no, no, that's in my life. Okay. I'm not getting on you. I'm just saying it's time to treat, it's time to give the tree some treatment, isn't it? It's time to do something to make that tree grow. It's time to do something to make that tree produce fruit. There's something going on that, and then here's the hard part, that we've got to get real with ourselves about and say, okay, well, why don't I have joy? How come I am mad all the time? Part of time I'm mad is because we keep reading Facebook. <laughs> We're watching the news. Not all the news is bad. All right, that's joy. Number three, don't worry. Don't be anxious. It says be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. See, we live in a country right now, right now where we live, 35 to 40%, 35 to 40%, say 35 to 40%, 35 to 40%. of everybody you know is on an antidepressant. Statistically. And that's not bad. I'm not saying if you need if your doctor says take a pill, take a pill. What I'm saying is, is that we're living in a society that is so messed up. It's causing us collectively to lose our peace. So don't leave here saying I didn't say take a pill. I'm saying if your doctor says take a pill, take a pill. If that'll help. But what I'm saying is, what's the cause? Where does all that coming from? Well, it's coming from the enemy of our soul, isn't it? It's coming from the enemy of our soul. Not only that, you know, I mean, we've, we, I mean, in the last 18 months, in the last 18 months, do you know that the, the use of alcohol has gone up, I forget what the percent is, like big time, big time, because people are like, I gotta do something. I've got to do something with this anxiety. I've got to do something with this stress. And so what's happening is, you know, anxiety becomes fear. Right? Worry or anxiety is worry on steroids. Fear is anxiety that's all out of control, isn't it? Because we just, it's like, what else can happen? Well, you know. And yet, I say to you this, God put us here for this time. Does God make any mistakes? No. Okay, so he put us here for this time knowing what? Knowing that there'd be headwinds, right? For such a time as this, he's put us here. And I think that some of what we've gone through and are continuing to go through with this pandemic is... is Maybe some people, for the first time in their life, have to trust something other than themselves. Because we don't know what's happening next. Right? right? You just don't know what's happening next. And as Americans, it's like, well, I'm going to take care of this. 
I'm an American. I'm a red-blooded American boy. I'll go to the hardware store and buy the part and fix it. And if I have to pull, if I have to pull Barb's tooth, I, Larry said I was going to offer to pull her tooth. I've got an ice cream. I'll take care of it. Cause that's what we do as Americans. We take care of stuff. And then Barb was in anxiety after that. But I'm just saying. <laughs> but you know what do you do when you can't go to the hardware store to buy something to fix this? You can't go someplace and buy something to fix this. Jesus told us what to do. He said something in Matthew 6. Turn in your Bible to Matthew 6. Jesus talked about anxiety. God knows us. He gave us emotions. He made us in his image. And therefore, he gave us emotions. Without emotions, we'd never be able to praise him. We'd never be able to experience joy without emotion. And who put that there? God put that there. Because he made us in his image. Which is, allows him to receive our praise as well. Right? But emotions gone out of control, you know? It's not the emotions that are bad. It's the stuff that's, that's dragging us there. There's something underneath that's causing us to be fearful, like the pandemic. So Jesus said, I, let me tell you how, how I think about this. So Matthew 6 is how Jesus thinks about anxiety. He says, for this reason, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 25. Chapter 6 of Matthew, verse 25, says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow nor reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow what's going to be thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? And then Jesus says something. He says, oh, you have little faith. Don't you trust me? Don't you trust me? Don't worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. And by Gentiles, he means the non-believers. Non-believers seek all these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own, doesn't it? And that's true. Worry and anxiety says... Worry and anxiety says God is not big enough to take care of my problem. And I get it. There's stuff that I'm not making light and I'm not being, I'm not trivializing the heavy stuff that we go through because we go through heavy stuff. Sin puts us in situations we never, ever, ever wanted to be in, right? Sin puts us into places we never wanted to be in, situations we never wanted to be in. Stuff happens and it's agonizing at times. But God says, I'll be a part of it. I'll be there. I'll help you if you let me. But if we are worry and fearful, kind of, sort of, means we haven't included God in the mix of the problem, right? There's times. Or do we really believe? When we pray, do we really believe? I know he's got it. Now, understand me. Understand. Well, I don't hear what I'm not saying, Right? We want him in the problem doesn't mean that he's going to remove the problem or remove us from the problem. But he may take us through. The best example I can give you is the Jesus in the boat with the disciples. They go, we're going to die and you don't even care. <laughs> That's what they told him. We're going to die and you don't care. You're back here sleeping. But his will was to get to the other side. He told them we're going to the other side. But they had to endure the storm and sometimes we do too. And I don't say that. I don't say it without hell and yet telling you I have, you know, gone through stuff just like you go through stuff. And it's agonizing at the time to go through stuff. It's agonizing. But he said, do you trust me or do you not? That's his, that's his question. 
I decided one time, I was down on my knees praying at 2 o'clock in the morning. This is kind of a habit. I can lay there and toss and turn, or I can get up and go pray. And I decided one time, years ago, I said, I'm either going to trust you or I'm going to, I'm going to quit saying amen in church and I'm going to quit teaching Sunday school. I'm, I'm, I've either got to trust you or not. And guess what? My problem didn't go away, but it changed my attitude. And I saw him do things that I'd never seen him do before. Amen. And he finally got me through, but he got me through on his terms and in his time. And I quit praying God in a box. Because we tell him, oh, it's got to be just like this or you're not working. Doug's back there shaking his head. And it's true. Sometimes we tell him, this is what you've got to do, God. And I, I, it's like I finally figured out more than halfway through my life, oh, maybe, maybe I'm praying wrong. Maybe I shouldn't tell him what to do. Maybe I just should bring him into the situation and say, I'll let you fix it. <laughs> Some guys, it just takes a little longer. Amen. Dr. Tony Evans says this, the more you worry, the less you pray. But the more you pray, the less you worry. Number four, which brings us to that. Pray about everything we face, verse 6, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When we pray, when we make our requests known to God, Paul says to make sure we're offering thanks to him as well. Look at that, verse 6 says, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, even in the midst of our chaos, we still have something to be thankful for, don't we? We still have something to be thankful for, even in the midst of our chaos. So we trust him and we thank him for what he has done, or in faith believing, we thank him for what he's going to do. God, I know you're going to take care of this for me. I don't know how it's going to be done. I don't know what you're going to do. I'm not going to pray you in the box. I just know, Lord, you're going to take care of this. Paul is saying, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. That's what he's saying. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. We get God's peace, he says. The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus when we do that. See, I don't... I just, I, you know, you're going to say, well, Steve, explain that to me. I can't explain it. Paul didn't either. <laughs> Verse 7. It surpasses all comprehension. Or in the Old Testament, or the Old uh, King James Version, the peace that pass, surpasses all understanding. Right? So he will guard our hearts and our minds. I can't tell you how it works. I just know that it does because it says it will. We should be at peace when everything is going our way, and we should be at peace when everything is not. We should be. At, let me put it this way. Let me emphasize it again. We should be at peace when everything's going our way, right? Amen. Paul's saying, even when it's not, be at peace because the one you are praying to is greater than your problem, greater than my problem. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. He either can or he can't. He declares that he can. He says I can. He says I am able. And because he says that, I believe he can, don't you? I believe he can. We can only learn... Some things, let me put it this way. Sometimes we can only learn in the mess. When everything's going right, we kind of don't learn new things. It's when we're in the mess that we learn that he can <coughs> and that he is able. Okay, number five. Think about, focus on the good, positive things. Verse eight. Find the brother whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. If there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Let your mind dwell on these things. Getting the peace of God and keeping the peace of God are two different things. Right? right. Getting the peace of God and keeping the peace of God are two different things. So most of the time... Most of the time, most of the time, we can get his peace or we can lose his peace. It kind of depends on where we let our mind go. If we focus on things that are good and pure and lovely and all of that, 
He says that's how you get his peace. If you keep focusing on those, I think that's how we keep his peace. Let me, let me put it this way. Real quick. Social media does not promote those standards, by and large, right? By and large, uh, if, if, if you get on social media and 15 mi minutes later you're angry, you probably should not get on there. <laughs> Five minutes might do the job, right? If we allow things, external things, to wash away those things, then we're not spending enough time in, in, the, in the right place. So our mind is really important. Our mind is really important. You know what it says. It says, think once before you say it. Think twice before you do it. Think three times before you put it on Facebook. <laughs> if the things that we allow our mind to dwell on end up making us angry, fearful, unhappy, and all the things that are anti what that says is, we're probably spending our time in the wrong places. And that includes watching the news. There's times you just want to sh throw a shoe at the TV, right? What are these people thinking? And it's not that we don't want to know the news, but sometimes it just becomes overwhelming, doesn't it? Which, we're working backwards, it ends up why we're in anxiety. But he says... Whatever is true and honorable and right, where do you find those things? Where do you find what's true? Well, part of it comes from spending time in the Word of God, doesn't it? The more time we spend in the Word of God, the more that we're spending around able to determine, able to discern in our life what is true. See, because if, if this tells us what is true, if this is the defining piece for what we know is to be true, then we measure everything else by this. If what we find in here is honorable, then we measure everything else by what the Word of God says is honorable. If what the Word of God says is right, we understand that, then we start saying, you go, well, that's not right because the Bible says this is right and that's not right, you know? And so how do we get there? This is how we get there. We get there by spending time in His Word. So... There's that. Next one is practice what you preach, verse 9. The things that you've learned and heard and seen in me, practice these things. It's one thing to say it, and it's another thing to completely do it, isn't it? It's one thing to say it, it's another thing to do it. Paul says, practice these things. Practice these things that you've seen me do. And so Paul, in kind of a way, became a discipler. You know, when you disciple somebody, you show them how to live in Christ. You know? And Paul is saying, you saw me do this. This is what you all need to do too. If you want victory, if you want the peace of God to, to, to uh, be in your life, this is what we do. This is how to do it. Practice these things, he says. So, the seven are stand firm in the Lord. Rejoice. Express the joy God has given us as believers. Be joyful. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't be fearful. Pray about everything. Think about, focus on good things, practice what we preach, choose to do right. If we do all of those things, all six of those things, look at the last thing it says there, verse 7 and verse 9. The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. We get both the peace of God in our life and the presence of God in our life. We get the peace of God in our life and the presence of God in our life. You know, in Psalm 23, guys, come back up. I want to do just a verse and a chorus, or just a chorus, actually. Peace seems to be hard to get, but in Psalm 23, which seems to get read a lot at, at, at funerals, and I'm going, it's wait, don't wait to the funeral to read this one. This one's really too good to, to, to just read at the funeral. Because David declares for us that God is his source to do it all. He says in Psalm 23, he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. 
Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. You prepare a feast before me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. All my hope. I will live in the house of the Lord forever. 